In 1989, Tim Burton's Batman movie came out, and it was definitely the most talked about and most anticipated movie of the year, and is still regarded as one of the greatest superhero movies of all time. This movie introduces Michael Keaton as Bruce Wayne and his crime-fighting alter ego Batman, who lurks the dark back streets of Gotham City in order to take on some of Gotham City's most terrifying criminals, where Batman must take on the terrifying criminal known as the Joker, played with delightful menace by Jack Nicholson, who is hell-bent on poisoning Gotham City and causing as much chaos as possible. All while, Bruce Wayne tries to balance out his private life with photographer Vicki Vale, played by Kim Basinger, who has fallen in love with Bruce, but he fears of her getting caught up in his dangerous life of dressing up as a menacing bat creature. In this action-packed adventure spectacle, which handles its subject matter with maturity and care and has plenty of heart. So today we are exploring 10 things that you didn't know about Batman, which these days is affectionately known as Batman 89. So come on, let's get nuts. Here's some nuts. Let's check it out. Chapter 10, we nearly got a Batman in space movie. So during the 70s, Batman's popularity was on a downward spiral. The campy but fun 1960s TV series had long finished, and in the public eye, superheroes were seen as an old-fashioned niche gimmick. However, CBS still had some interest in the Batman character, and got the idea of making a movie which was to see Batman and Robin go into outer space. However, in the late 70s, Superman the movie came out and was a massive hit and finally showed that the superhero tale can be told respectfully, with heart, dignity and grace, with intelligence and even believability. Suddenly, a new dawn of the superhero was rising. So producers Benjamin Melnicka and Michael E. Uslan had bought the movie rights to Batman in 1979, one year after the release of Superman the Movie, and they intended to make a Batman movie which, like Superman the Movie, would step away from the comical, campy image of the 60s and make the characters more believable and relatable. They wanted to return to Batman's origins of being a dark, mysterious creature of the night who inflicts fear into his enemies. So sadly to all those who are hoping to see a Batman movie where the Cape Crusader goes into outer space, well, this idea was scrapped once Uslan and Melnicka came on the scene. Chapter 9, the 1983 Batman movie that nearly was. So producers Uslan and Melnicka pitched a Batman movie to nearly every big studio, but each one of them turned it down. And those who were interested wanted to make the Batman movie campy and tongue-in-cheek like the 1960s TV show. It seemed that studios just couldn't get the image of Batman surfing out of their heads. But Uslan and Melnicka were taking inspiration of how Batman was currently being portrayed in the comics at that time. Dark, gritty and violent. They weren't taking inspiration from the 60s TV show, but rather popular Batman comics at the time. However, despite being turned down by several studios, the project was still gaining traction, with fellow producers John Peters and Peter Goober coming on board to invest in the project, of which their production company produced other big hits of the 80s, including An American Werewolf in London, Rain Man and Gorillas in the Mist. Finally, Warner Brothers, the same studio behind the Superman movies, came on board to produce a Batman movie, and the duties of penning a new Batman script were given to Tom Mankiewicz, who not only penned three James Bond movies, but was also a creative consultant for the script for Superman the movie. Mankiewicz's script was greenlit in 1983, with an allocated budget of $20 million, and went under the title of The Batman. 
based on the Batman comic Strange Apparitions, and was to focus on the origins of both Batman and Robin, with the Joker, the Penguin, and Rupert Fawn as the baddies. Several directors were being sought after to direct, including Joe Dante, Wes Craven, and Ivan Reitman. In fact, when Ivan Reitman was in talks, he envisioned Bill Murray as Bruce Wayne and Batman, as well as Eddie Murphy as Dick Grayson and Robin. Other casting choices were David Niven as Alfred and Peter O'Toole as the Penguin. However, fate would have other plans for this version of Batman. Chapter 8 Beetlejuice Saved the Day So Tom Mankiewicz's script would go through many rewrites, nine to be precise, with elements constantly changing and things being added and taken away, with all the scripts focusing on the Strange Apparition storyline. However, in 1985, something happened which would change the course of the Batman movie. That being the release of Pee-wee's Big Adventure, which was a surprise hit for Warner Brothers, bringing in $40 million on a $7 million budget. The movie was directed by former Disney employee and uprising director and visionary Tim Burton. Warner Brothers thought that Burton would be perfect for Batman, as thanks to Pee-wee's Big Adventure, he proved to have a unique visionary style. However, Burton didn't like the current Tom Mankiewicz script, finding it to be too campy. Burton wanted to take inspiration from two Batman comics that had just come out at that time, those being The Killing Joke and The Dark Knight Returns, both comics which showed just how dark and dangerous the world of Batman could be. Burton got his then-girlfriend at the time, Julie Hicks, to write a treatment of the new story, as well as approaching comic book writer Sam Hamm to write a new script. And during this process, drastic changes were made, including the removal of characters like Robin and the Penguin, as well as not making the movie an origin story, but to start off with Batman already as a developed mystical figure of Gotham City, as Ham felt that not showing Bruce Wayne transforming into Batman would add more mystery, and that credibility would be lost if the process was shown. Other elements were added, such as the character Vicky Vale and Carl Grissom and the script now resembled the 1989 movie. Well, for the most part. And when Warner Brothers were given the new script, they... Ugh, completely lost interest and shut the production down. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, they just weren't really enthusiastic with this new direction, despite Batman's co-creator Bob Kane loving it. So Burton went and did what any other director in his position would do. He went and made Beetlejuice, of course. And wow, what a movie. Just like Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Beetlejuice was a surprise hit that no one saw coming. Beetlejuice was a massive success that made over $74 million and won an Academy Award for Best Special Effects. So after the release of Beetlejuice in 1988, I guess Warner Brothers decided that Tim Burton does know what he's doing after all, and thus Batman was immediately greenlit under Burton's guidance and direction. So literally, Beetlejuice saved Batman's bacon. In other words, no Beetlejuice, no Batman. Chapter 7. The casting of Michael Keaton caused controversy and outrage. So the big and important search was on to find who can step into the cape of Batman. Now this casting would have had to have been done right with the right actor, in order to make the movie work. Several big names were considered and approached, including Mel Gibson, Ray Liotta, Charlie Sheen, Kevin Costner, and even future James Bond Pierce Brosnan. John Peters recommended Michael Keaton, feeling he could do edgy and tormented after seeing him in the drama movie Clean and Sober. And Burton liked this idea, having previously worked with Keaton on Beetlejuice, where Keaton played the title character. Burton also felt that Keaton had the qualities of an everyman, someone that you wouldn't suspect of being Batman. So Michael Keaton was announced as the new Batman of the modern age, and... The Batman fandom lost its frickin' mind. Obsessive in his anger and fixation on revenge. But will he be portrayed that way in a new movie from Warner Brothers coming out in June? Many hardcore fans are afraid he won't. They have been writing hundreds of letters to Warner Brothers since they found out about the man cast as Batman. People were outraged with the idea of Keaton playing Batman, despite the fact that his casting was based off his performance from Clean and Sober, in the public eye, he was known as Mr. Mum and Beetlejuice. 
Basically, he was seen as a wacky comedian, and people thought that he was just wrong. There were complaints that he was too much of a wimp, he wasn't strong enough, he wasn't sexy enough, and he was too short. I think that he's kind of a wimp. It don't seem that it's right, you know, that you should have a smaller man playing as a Batman. I would have liked to have seen a sexier person, you know, a more macho man. He's balding, he's short, he's not broad, he's, he's just not... There, he's not Batman. In fact, Warner Brothers received a whopping 50,000 angry letters from comic book fans protesting the casting of Keaton as Batman. There are even talks of mass boycotts. In an attempt to calm the angry backlash, a trailer was very quickly put together to show people the tone and mood of the movie is going in the right direction and that Keaton is the right man for the job. The trailer was so hastily put together, it didn't even feature background music. But it worked, the trailer was a hit, and got people sold on the movie's tone and Keaton's casting. Now I'm more willing to give it a try, I'm more willing to take a look at it. In fact, it's reported that people were going to the theatre just to see the Batman trailer, and then leaving once it was shown, a whole 10 years before the same thing happened with the Phantom Menace trailer. And of course Batman comes out, and Michael Keaton is suddenly the best Batman ever. He really was quite literally perfect in the role. Chapter 6, Jack Nicholson's Highly Rewarding Terms and Conditions Ever since the early 80s, Jack Nicholson was always the number one choice to play the Joker. I mean, just look at the guy. He already looks like the Joker, even without the makeup. Even if you watch The Shining, which came out nine years before Batman, you can really see the Joker coming out in him. <laughs> Although other actors were considered for the part, including Tim Curry, Brad Dourif, and David Bowie. That's weird. Robin Williams really lobbied to get the part, but was unsuccessful. John Lithgow auditioned, and it seemed that his audition was successful. But he then got cold feet, and would then talk Burton out of casting him, which he would later go on to regret. Burton's initial choice for the Joker was John Glover, who had previously starred in Scrooged, but Warner Brothers felt that he was too much of an unknown and wanted a big name, so Warner Brothers went back to their initial choice of Jack Nicholson. However, being the big time actor that he was, he had some terms and conditions, those being a set number of hours that he was allowed to have off during the shoot, as well as being allowed time off to go and see Lakers games, hey, you've got to catch up on those Lakers games, I guess, as well as his friend Tracy Walter being cast in the movie, Movie, which led to the creation of Bob the Goon, but hey, I don't mind as who doesn't love Bob, and due to being paid six million dollars, which is lower than his standard ten million dollar fee, Nicholson was granted a cut in the movie's box office profits and merchandise, and given that Batman was a huge merchandising juggernaut, I can imagine that Nicholson really was truly laughing, <laughs> all the way to the bank. It is said that his total profit may have been $50 million, but some have speculated that it could even be as high as $90 million. But you know what? Warner Brothers got what they paid for, as Nicholson steals the show and delivers a truly memorable performance. You can call me Joker. And as you can see, I'm a lot happier. Love that Joker. Other casting includes Michael Goff as Alfred Pennyworth, Pat Hingle as Commissioner Gordon, Billy D. Williams as Harvey Dent, Jack Palance as Carl Grissom, and Robert Wool as Alexander Knox. When it came to Bruce Wayne's love interest, Vicki Vale, originally Blade Runner actress Sean Young was cast in the part. However, just before filming was to start, she was injured in a horse riding accident. So the part had to be immediately recast with an actress who was able to come onto the set and start filming straight away. So Uprising star Kim Basinger was approached and subsequently cast. Now I find that Basinger often gets a lot of flack for doing a lot of screaming throughout the film, but I still find her performance to be very enjoyable and she has a lot of heart and likability. And she also has amazing chemistry with both Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. She is also absolutely beautiful too. Chapter 5, Constructing the Myth So the dark and surreal world of Gotham City would be created all the way in London, England, namely Pinewood Studios. The shoot lasted from October 1988 to February 1989. 
It was originally intended to film Batman in warm and cozy California, but eagerly watching and observing media made the production move to a much colder England. When it came to the look of Gotham City, Burton wanted to go for a dirty and foggy industrial world full of decay and neon lights, but didn't want it to resemble Blade Runner. In fact, all of those involved in the production were banned from watching Blade Runner as not to be influenced by it. It is said that the look of Gotham was heavily influenced by the dark future world of Terry Gilliam's Brazil, in that it's a decaying, nightmarish, futuristic industrial city, with a 1930s and 1940s noir style, and neon lights. I think in Gotham City's design, you can also see homages to Hammer Horror movies too, which Burton was a fan of. When it came to the look of Batman himself, Burton abandoned the traditional grey and blue look, in favour of an all-black one, as well as the removal of tights and underpants in favour of latex. The suit looked bulky and rubbery, and was apparently claustrophobic for Michael Keaton to wear. John Peters really wanted to add some Nike product placement to the Batsuit, which is why if you look at Batman's feet more carefully, you can see the Dark Knight's choice of shoes is Nike. The logo was also changed, where the Bat logo now had more pointy wings on it. Now, there are several reasons I found online as to why the Bat symbol in Batman 89 looks so different. One being that it was a licensing issue, and that they didn't know if they could license the traditional logo, despite the fact that licensing would go through. As well as another explanation being that it was a mistake on the designer's part, to finally they just wanted to try a different look and make the logo look slightly gothic. It's not really a big issue, but I always found it weird that the logo in the movie looks different, and yet the movie's poster uses the traditional logo. The shoot for Batman was supposedly anything but pleasant, with Burton going on to call the experience torture, and the worst experience of his life. There was several issues that took place during filming, such as the budget ballooning from $30 million to $48 million, as well as urgent script rewrites being required, of which Sam Han was unavailable due to a writer's strike, to which other writers would have to be brought in to do rewrites. And on one bizarre occasion, about 20 minutes worth of film reels were stolen from the set, to which even the police had to be called in and investigate and I couldn't find out if the footage was returned or if they had to do reshoots of the scenes that were stolen. Yeah, basically filming this movie was a real pain in the bat ass. Chapter 4, Music by the Elfman and the Prince. Former Oingo Boingo band member Danny Elfman was brought in to score Batman, as prior he had scored Burton's previous movies, Pee-wee's Big Adventure and Beetlejuice. And wow! What an amazing score he provides. His music perfectly captures the essence of Batman. It sounds gothic, creepy, and mysterious, while also sounding action-packed and heroic. He really did define the sound of Batman, much in the same way that John Williams did for Superman. However, there was hesitation for hiring Elfman, as he hadn't worked on a big movie of that scale before. But when his music was turning up, that hesitation had diminished. Although Elfman was disappointed with the final product of his music, feeling that the sound engineers let his music down. But personally, I don't know what he's talking about, as I think his music sounds perfect in Batman. Producer John Peters originally wanted Prince and Michael Jackson to work on the music for Batman. Something that Burton was against, feeling that he doesn't make commercial movies, citing Top Gun as an example of said commercial movie. Jackson, who was friends with Peters, was unavailable due to touring. But Prince did get on board, and he recorded a Batman album with nine songs, although only three would be used in the movie itself. One song that wasn't used in the movie, but was used as a huge part of Batman's marketing, was the song Bat Dance, which was accompanied by a music video, which is kind of cringy. But when I say cringy, I mean in a fun, cheesy 80s kind of way. It features Prince in a sort of half-Batman, half-Joker attire, making him kind of look like Two-Face, where we have a heap of dancing Batmans and a heap of dancing Jokers. And if you get sick of all these Batman and Jokers, no problem, time to unleash the army of Vicky Vales. <laughs> None of whom seem to be played by Kim Basinger. I guess she was just too busy that day. 
Yeah, this music video is really weird and really dated. But come on, it's Prince. How can you not love it? The song uses the tune from the 1960s TV show, which is interesting as the movie actively goes out of its way to not be 1960s Batman. And throughout the song, Prince does this scream, and I have no idea what he says. Catgar Wonga? Batgirl Wonder? Batman's Funya? That goes Funder? I don't know. Well, I've looked up the song's lyrics, and he's apparently saying, Get the funk up. So there, that's my 30 year plus mystery solved. Prince also did a music video for Party Man, where he enters a masked ball and is still in his half Joker makeup. Both the Batman soundtrack by Elfman and pop song album by Prince sold very well and were hits. Now I've noticed over the years that fans are split with the Prince music. There are some fans who feel like his songs in the movie feel out of place and do age the movie. Whereas there are others who feel that the songs are part of the movie and are lots of fun and gives it energy. By the way, I love this picture of Prince promoting the Batman soundtrack on roller skates. If that doesn't get you in the mood to do the bat dance, then nothing will. Get the fuck up! Chapter 3 Deleted Scenes. Now, there are several scenes in Batman that were going to be filmed but were written out, and some of which were filmed but then deleted. Originally, the movie's climax was going to feature Robin. It was in the scene where Gotham's centenary party takes place in the street. You see, originally there was to be other circus acts, including the Flying Graysons, made up of Dick Grayson and his parents, of which Dick's parents are killed off by the Joker, setting up Robin's journey in the sequel, but this was ultimately scrapped. The movie was also originally meant to end with the Joker killing Vicky Vale, which sends Batman off into a rage, of which was wisely written out. We all know the famous scene where Batman utters the line, I'm Batman. Well, originally he was meant to say, I am the Knight, but it was Keaton himself who suggested the line, I'm Batman. However, the alternative line of I am the Knight would make it into the movie's comic book adaptation. In fact, the comic book features several deleted scenes, such as Batman putting up his hands to surrender to police at Axis Chemicals before fleeing, which was even filmed but not used, as well as a scene at the end where the police find Knox laying in the street with Batman's cape, which leads them to believe that Knox is Batman, another scene that was filmed but unused. The comic book shows a scene where it's revealed that the money that the Joker is giving to the city is fake, and features the Joker's head. Other deleted scenes include alternative shots of the Joker confronting Grissom, and then approaching his dead corpse. What's interesting about these shots is the Joker's attire looks slightly different, as he's wearing a pink suit with a yellow shirt and black tie, which he doesn't wear in the final film. And even his makeup looks a little off, which makes me wonder if this was filmed in the early stages of designing the Joker's look. Another scene sees Batman running around the art museum, a scene at the end where Vicky is confronted by two kids dressed up as Batman, I guess this scene was signifying that Batman has now become a hero of the people, and finally we have the alleyway fight. In the final movie, Batman turns to Bob the Goon, who then flees as not to get a Batman beatdown, but originally there was a scene where Bob attacks Batman with his knife. There is even footage of the scene being filmed. And the most famous of the deleted scenes involves Batman finding a little girl in said alleyway, and picks her up and takes her to safety, where she asks, Is it Halloween? Yeah, I don't know about this shot. There's something about Batman's head which just doesn't look right. Speaking of unused material, there are many posters which were designed but incidentally not used. Some of them look really fascinating and had great potential to be the poster of Batman 89. And some even look kind of creepy and surreal. But despite all these potential posters being made, at the end of the day, nothing beats the Batman logo. It's simple, but effective, and lets you know right away that Batman is here, and he is here in a very spectacular way. Chapter 2. Toys, Toys, and More Toys. 
So with the release of Batman, it was merchandise galore, as there was pretty much Batman everything, from video games and even Batman cereal. But the most interesting part of Batman's merchandising was the action figures, which was released by two different toy brands, those being Toy Biz and Kenner. So how did this anomaly come to be? Well, it goes back to 1984, when leading toy company Kenner released a lineup of DC action figures called Superpowers, which featured favourite characters like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and many others. However, by 1986, Kenner gave up on the toy line, thinking that there wasn't a market to sell action figures based on DC superheroes, a decision I'm sure they regretted three years later after the huge success of Batman. Shortly before the release of the Batman movie, Warner Brothers were naturally trying to find a toy brand to produce a string of Batman action figures based on the movie. But a lot of toy manufacturers really weren't interested, as word of mouth suggested that this Batman movie was going to be quite dark, and probably not something the young Batman fans would want to get toys of. So a newly formed toy company called Toy Biz purchased the rights to make the action figures and accessories based off the Batman movie, which consisted of three action figures, including Batman, the Joker, and Bob the Goon. The moulds of Batman and the Joker's bodies were just recycled moulds from the Kenner Superpowers action figure lineup. only the figures were given a new coat of paint. And to make matters worse, Toy Biz weren't given photos of how Batman and the Joker looked in the movie. So they just gave Batman a square head, and the Joker looked just like how he did in the comics. After the release of the movie, they would later make changes to Batman's head, making it more rounder, in an attempt to make it look more like Michael Keaton. And the Joker was given a fringe curl, for some reason. Toy Biz then released a line of other figures based on DC characters, and called it DC Comic Book Superheroes, and most of them were once again recycled moulds from the Superpowers lineup, and included characters like Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Green Lantern, and Robin. They even released a Batman doll with a removable bat suit, which when I was a kid I always thought was weird. However, Warner Brothers were not happy with the quality of action figures that Toy Biz had released for Batman, so Toy Biz lost the rights to make DC toys. So Kenner returned and came on board to release a new action figure lineup in 1990, called The Dark Knight Collection, a whole year after the release of Batman. These figures and vehicles generally had better quality and presentation, and looked more movie accurate. This time, Batman and the Joker didn't look like recycled moulds of pre-existing toys, but they actually looked like Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson. However, the lineup didn't feature any other characters other than Batman and the Joker. So to combat this, there was lots of Batmans with different paint jobs. Like you had Blue Batman, Grey Batman, Orange Batman, Gold Batman, Purple Batman, and so on. Just get those wonderful toys. I should also point out that a lot of the info I got about the Batman 89 toys came from another YouTube video called Toy Biz to Kenner, The Return of Batman Action Figures by a channel called That Junk Man. So you should totally check that video out. It was very helpful for this segment. Yeah, both the Toy Biz and Kenner lineups were flawed. They were fun, but they were flawed. But that didn't stop us kids from running to the toy stores and demanding our parents to get them for us. Chapter 1 Batman takes over the world. So to say that there was great hype for the Batman movie of 1989 would be an understatement. This beast was huge and everyone was talking about it. And I think you kind of had to be around at that time to fully understand just how Batman was just everywhere. The movie was released in June 1989 and made over $411 million on its $48 million budget. I guess putting the movie in the hands of Burton and Keaton, as well as Nicholson with his basketball game privileges, really paid off. The irony is, Batman was released at the same time as Ghostbusters 2, and there were many expectations and predictions that that movie was going to be the big hit that devoured the box office. But Ghostbusters 2 only made $215 million, so it was Batman that was the true victor. The movie also won an Academy Award for Best Art Direction, and Jack Nicholson was nominated for a Golden Globe for his performance as the Joker. 
and the movie's success immediately led to developments of a sequel and an animated series. Although, despite its successes, the movie did get mixed reviews. Some critics didn't know how to feel about this darker, more violent Batman world. I guess a lot of people still had memories of the 1960s Batman TV series, and just didn't know how to take this new age of Batman. Avid comic book fans also had issues with the concept of the Joker, aka Jack Napier, killing Batman's parents. But all that aside, the general movie audience and children loved this movie and couldn't get enough of it. Trust me, I was there. And even to this day, many consider it to be one of the best superhero movies of all time, and even the greatest Batman movie of all time. Batman 89 represented a creative shift in the world of Batman, where the character was no longer seen as a comical joke, but a real character with conflict and turmoil and heart. And yes, this approach was already in the comics at that time, but it was now taken to the mainstream, and the world of Batman has never been the same since. Well, nearly never been the same since. Thanks to Tim Burton's direction, Batman 89 is a dark, arthouse superhero masterpiece. A movie that every Batman fan seems to embrace. Over 30 years later, its fandom is still running strong. And for good reason. It really is, truly a brilliant movie. Yeah, look, I'm not going to lie. I love this movie. Absolutely love it. I can actually remember watching it for the very first time. My parents rented it for me from a video store when it was first released on home video. And I can remember watching it and being blown away and I literally stopped and rewound the video and watched it all over again. And the funny thing is, I haven't stopped doing that. I've kind of been doing it ever since the first time I saw this movie as a kid. I just can't stop watching it. Anyway, I'm Minty and thanks for watching and I want you to do me a favour. I want you to tell all your friends about me. I'm Minty. See ya!